Uh, hey, welcome to week two of our message series called uh, All In, where we've been discovering really what it looks like for us to, to be able to unlock uh, the life that God has promised us. And you may wonder, what, what kind of life has God promised us? Well, Jesus talked about it in John chapter 10, verse 10. This is what he said when he's talking about the life that he's promised, that it would be a better life than they ever dreamed of. The Apostle Paul said it like this in Ephesians. He put that, that promise that it would be immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. And I love that part in the beginning, who is able, he who is able to do it. And I know some of you might be here and you're thinking, okay, well, that sounds great. I see it in the Bible, but why am I not experiencing that kind of life in my everyday life. And I would kind of put it this way, and it's up on the screens, that we miss out on God's promises because we aren't willing, not because God isn't able. Because we aren't willing, not because God isn't able. And what, what are we not willing to do? Like, what is it about our life that we are unwilling to do that keeps us from experiencing all that God has promised us, well, it's kind of wrapped up in our series title that is going all in. That so oftentimes in our life, we are unwilling to go all in with God. And last week, uh, Andrea talked about um, the idea of generosity. She talked about this biblical principle of sowing and what? And reaping. Sowing and reaping. And so... So many times for us, we wrap up this idea of sowing and reaping um, all about money, right? And anytime we hear the word generosity or the phrase sowing and reaping, like everybody's double checking their, their wallet to make sure that the ushers didn't snag it on their way in, on your way in, like, like we just, there's something about us that gets weirded out about this idea of generosity and this phrase of sowing and reaping. But what we learned last week is that this principle of sowing and reaping, that really if we think about that only through the context of money, then we are short-sighting ourselves. Because in scripture, this idea of sowing and reaping is so much bigger than just money. It, it really applies to every area of our life. That, that as we sow forgiveness, we reap forgiveness. That as we sow just just serving other people that we reap that, that as we, as we lean into God and sow into his kingdom, then we reap his blessings in our life. And so today, what I wanna do is I wanna continue uh, th this thread of generosity, which Andrea said last week, uh, generosity is living life with an open hand rather than a closed fist. That we're gonna make, we're gonna live with the mentality that God, you've blessed me with everything I have, therefore I'm gonna live my life with an open hand, not trying to control the outcome, not trying to control whether or not you get this or you get that, but living, having a heart of generosity means that I'm, I'm gonna live like this, God, and whatever it is that you want from me in my life, because you have blessed me over and above, because you have given so much, I'm going to give it back to you. And so I wanna continue this idea of living life with an open hand rather than a closed fist by talking to you from this topic today, being generous with ourselves, being generous with ourselves. If you got your Bible, turn with me to John chapter 13, and we'll get there in just a moment. But uh, let's pray. Let's prepare our heart today for what the Lord wants to say. Uh, say this out loud with me, Father, as I open your word today, speak to me. May I have ears to hear a heart to receive, and the courage to respond. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, one of the hardest things uh, for a pastor is what, um, what you call a farewell sermon. And uh, I had to give that sermon in the state of Washington when we began the transition uh, from the church that we were pastoring there uh, here to Tallahassee to become uh, your pastors here at Transformation Church. And, you know, I, I, remember, I remember going through the process of, 
of thinking this is the last opportunity that I'm going to have to be able to stand in front of this congregation and to, and to share my heart about the gratitude of the journey that we've been on together, like, like the ups and the downs, and there's just something about that that, that draws, there's like a, a bond that's there that's really hard to put into words, but, but then there's always another side that every pastor wants to do, and that is they want to challenge the congregation They want to help them see the important things for them to be able to experience all that God has for them under new leadership and a new pastor. And I like to kind of say it this way, that that you kind of go into that as a pastor, into that message, really trying to help the congregation understand and how, how to keep the main thing the main thing. And this is what we see in John chapter 13, with Jesus. You see, in John 13, Jesus is a day before he goes to the cross. Now, the disciples have no idea what's coming up for Jesus, but for Jesus, he wants to have one more meal together with all of his disciples. And so, um, he sends this invite to them to, to come over and to, and to have supper together. And I, and I want you to kind of picture um, the, the moment, this is, um, scripture says that it's a, it's a borrowed room that they use. And, and I want you to imagine all these disciples coming over to, Jesus invited them to dinner, right? And so they're coming over to dinner and, um, and they walk through the door of this borrowed room and, and in the room is a U-shaped table, which is what was kind of customary in those days. And um, if, if you're short in the room, you would have loved it back then because all the tables were like this high, right? And, um, and so uh, they were kind of like coffee tables and it was a big U shape. And, and so the disciples are excited. They've, they've come from their house and they've walked and they've gone into the room and, and they walk in and they, and they kind of find a place around the table. And uh, what was customary in those days is that they would kind of they would kind of lay down, and I'm not going to do it because I'm afraid I wouldn't be able to get back up. Um, but they kind of lay down, and they would they would lean um, against the pillow, and uh, they'd kick their feet back, and um, and they would just they would just talk, and they would fellowship, and and they would eat, and 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 that was kind of what was was customary in those days. And and here's what's really so interesting about. This event, what, which was called the Last Supper, that's what we, we uh, know it as. And, and so they come in, and you would think that they would come in, and it would just be fellowship with Jesus and hanging out with each other. But they come in, and they do what the disciples do. They start arguing. They start arguing. Now, now this is what they start arguing about. Basically, who's the greatest in the kingdom again? Like Jesus had already addressed this with them before and they come in and here's kind of how it happens for them is that in this moment is they come in and what is custom is that whoever sits the closest to the host at the table is kind of looked at as, as, as you know, their status is higher than everybody else. So the closer you get to the host, the higher up your status is with everybody else. And and these guys come walking in the door for dinner and they're around the table arguing over who's gonna sit closest to Jesus. It, it, it so shocks me because here they are in the presence of Jesus. In the presence of Jesus, like he is right there. And all they can do is argue over which seat at the table they're going to have. Like he's right there. It made me kind of think this past week, like sometimes, sometimes we do this, the same thing, right? Like, like we can come into a place like this and, and Jesus is right there. Like we can be in worship and, and Jesus is right there. And instead of focusing on the fact that Jesus is right there. We get we start focusing on other stuff, right? Like, like having our seat in the auditorium, right? Um, now that's not really bad because, like, 
once I find like the spot, like I got a spot too, so it's not that bad. But we, we start focusing on other stuff like the temperature or the lights or the sound or, you know what I'm saying, the person that we see on the others. That's one of the negatives about this room is that if you sit over here, you can see everybody that's over here. Hey, wave to everybody over there and say, hey, you guys way back. Um, yeah, it gives me whiplash up here because I got to like spin around so much. Um, but we can be in worship and, and, and we can see the person walk in and the person that like, like has a grudge against us, right? And then we start, we start thinking about that and Jesus is right here in the room and we get, we get so focused on, on everything else and 99.9% .9 of the time, all the other stuff we get focused on is all about ourselves and how it impacts us and what we think about it. And, and so Jesus, like... <laughs> These guys are coming in and they're arguing around the table and Jesus just gets tired of the middle school drama, right? He just gets tired and, and, and for him, he's thinking like, these are the last hours that I have with my disciples. Like they have no idea, but in Jesus' mind and his heart, he feels the weight of the cross looming. And what does he do? He he gives his farewell sermon to these disciples. He, he talks to them about the times that they've had, but, but, but he talks about the thing like, he tries to explain to him how to keep the main thing, the main thing in the kingdom when he is gone. And what does he talk about? He talks about the importance of humility in their life, he talks about the importance of being generous, of, of living their life with open hands rather than a closed fist. And, and he talks about it specifically, not about money. He talks about it in the way that they serve others. I want you to look with me in John chapter 13 today. In verse four, it says that, speaking of Jesus, that that he gets up from the table. So they're all sitting around and they're arguing over, over who's gonna sit closest to Jesus. And, and Jesus gets up from the table, right? And it says that he takes, he takes off of his robe, he wraps a towel around his waist, he pours water into a basin, and, and then he began to do something that would have created so much tension and awkwardness in that room that he begins to wash the disciples' feet and drying them with the towel that he had, had around them. And the, and the reason why this would have created so much tension and so much awkwardness you see, for us, that's not as big of a deal. I mean, none of us really want to wash each other's feet, but it's not that big of a deal to us, but it was a huge deal for them back then. You see, I can tell you as the king of awkwardness. Now, if you have not tried to shake my hand after service, I've not been able to shake your hand, you wouldn't know. But if you have, you know that I am the king of awkward. You'll come with a handshake, I'll come with a fist bump, and then you're like, oh, it's fist bump, not handshake. And then you'll go to fist bump, and I'll go to handshake, and then it just becomes awkward. And I'm the king of awkward. And I'm telling you, in this moment, this would have been crazy awkward for Jesus to get up from the table and to begin to wash the disciples' feet. And here's the reason why. Is in first century Jewish culture, it was expected that the servant of the house would be the one that would wash the feet of guests that were coming over for dinner. Now, the way that this would have played out in their custom is because of this kind of dinner, the disciples would have, have bathed, and, and, and I'm going to skip over the interaction with Jesus and, and Simon Peter, but that's what, what Jesus is getting at in that, that part of the scripture is that the custom would be that they would have showered, they would have cleaned up, bathed, whatever, before they came to the dinner. But 
they would have had to walk along the same roads that all the animals walked on. And they didn't have cool shoes like we have today. They had open sandals. And so as they would begin to walk to the dinner and they would get to the place of residence, right, there would be dust all over their feet. There would be stuff from animals stuck between their toes. And they come in and the custom was that the servant would then wash their feet. He doesn't need to wash the rest of them, and that's what you see with Peter, like arguing over, no, no, wash all of me. And Jesus is like, I don't have to wash all of you because you've already done that. And that interaction is speaking of of salvation, and it's speaking of this idea of, of how when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we are washed clean. Right? We don't have to keep coming back to God every single week asking him to save us. That has happened. However, in our everyday lives, we walk through a lot of... <laughs> and that has to be cleaned off. And that's part of what coming into a fellowship like this is. That's part of why, why spending time alone with God in prayer and reading our word, it's this process that the Lord uses to wash the filth of the world and, and everything that tries to stick itself to us. It cleans us and washes us off. And, and so, so the custom was that they would come to the door and the servant would serve them, wash their feet, and then they would go find a place at the table. But here's the problem. Scripture says this was a borrowed room and there was no servant present. And so these disciples knew. They knew when they walked through that door what was customary. They knew when they walked through that door and saw no servant there that what they should have done was wash their own feet or wash each other's feet. They knew it. That was part of their custom. And instead of doing it, they walk in around the table with their nasty old feet smelling, arguing over who was going to sit closest to Jesus. Jesus lets them kind of do their middle school thing and, and everybody chuckling has had middle school students before. He, he kind of lets them do their thing and then he gets up from the table. I mean, why would the disciples not deal with their feet when they came in? Why would they walk in the door and just sit right by Jesus with their filthy old feet, arguing over who's going to sit the closest, who's the the greatest? You see, they had this they had this pride. They had they had ego, and we see that throughout Scripture of Jesus constantly trying to chip away at at the pride and the ego of of these guys, and none of them. You know, serving and washing somebody's feet was kind of the lowest responsibility. And none of them wanted to step into that. Like, none of them wanted to look, everybody in the room to look at them as the lowest. Because that's what would have happened if they would have started washing each other's feet. And Jesus, Jesus sees all of this. What does he do? Jesus gets up from the table and he gives these guys a lesson on true humility. I mean, consider consider the significance of this moment for a second. That Jesus, the Son of God, leaves his position of authority at the table. He removes his robe, which represents his divinity. And he picks up a towel and does the servant's job by washing everybody's dirty, filthy, nasty feet. I mean, the more that I think about 
this interaction, the more like mind blowing this is to me. And the reason why is because yes, he may have been washing their feet, but he did the same thing for you and me when he washed us of our sin. He did the same thing. Look what Philippians chapter two says. It says that though he was God, that he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, what he does is he gave up his divine privileges. He gets up from the table and he takes off his robe. He took the humble position of a slave, he was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, that he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Friend, we see disciples in that room, but it, it might as well be you and me. It might as well be you and me that walks through the doors with our dirty old feet and and tries to avoid the reality of what's going on in our life and, and to try to sit around the table of Jesus and, and even in the midst of Jesus get so focused on everything else in our life that we lose concentration at who is at the table. And these guys would have, when they sat down, they would have, they would have tucked, they would have had their arm against the pillow and they would have tucked their feet back trying to hide the reality of their filth Gosh, we do the same thing in our lives, the same exact thing. We see in verse 12 that Jesus says this, that after washing their feet, in other words, after, I mean, think of this, after Jesus works his way around the room, washing everyone's feet. Keyword, everyone's feet. Who was at that last supper? Judas. The man that was about to betray Jesus in just a few hours. And Jesus knew that it was Judas and Jesus knew that he was gonna do it. And despite that, Jesus still washes Judas's feet. I mean, he models humility and he models it not just to the, the ones that are gonna have his back, but he models it to even the one who doesn't. And it makes me think like, like how good, how good are we at serving people that we like and overlooking people that we don't? And in that room, Jesus washes everybody's feet. And it says in verse 12 that, that he put his robe, he gets done and he puts his robe back on again and, and he sits down at the table. And he looks at them and he says, do you understand what I was doing? Do you understand why, why I got up from the table? Do you understand why I got down in the midst of your filth and I, and I washed your feet? Do you understand why? And then I love this moment. He's like, <laughs> he's like, do you know why I created such an awkward moment? He says in verse 13, he says, you call me teacher and Lord. He says, you're right because that's what I am. And since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, he says, you ought to wash each other's feet. Church, I bet just like in this room, I bet around that table you could have heard a pin drop. The tension and the, and the weight of what Jesus was showing them and then in verse 15, he says, he says, listen, guys, I have given you an example to follow. He says, do as I have done to you. I don't think Jesus was doing all of this stuff. I don't think it was an effort for him to, to kind of construct some theology of, a feet washing. 
I think it was so much more than that. I think he was trying to help us see that true Christianity, that it risks getting dirty to help others get clean. That it risks us getting dirty in order to help other people get clean. That true Christianity is is marked by by sacrifice. It's marked by humility. And it's marked by by this lack of, of the need of personal gain or personal satisfaction, that it is that it is committed to making a difference and an impact in the lives of other people. I want to close today with a statement that Jesus says right right after this, that, that, friend, it had to have shaken them to the core. He says this in verse 17. Jesus says, now that you know these things, Now that you know these things, Jesus says, God will bless you for doing them. I mean, that had to, that had to be another one of those heavy statements in the room that Jesus is drawing this this separation between the idea of knowing and doing. Because all these disciples have been following Jesus for three years. They've heard all the lessons. They've watched Jesus perform miracles. They've been close to Jesus in every way possible. And Jesus is looking at them and saying, listen, I know that you know these things, but what I'm telling you today A day before I go to the cross, a day before I leave this mission of spreading the kingdom of God all across the world is this, is that there's a difference between knowing them and doing them. You know, it's March Madness kind of time and I played basketball when, I was younger, like five years ago, and um, <laughs> I told a friend, we got this, um, we got this, uh, I'm gonna let the cat out of the bag uh, now, but we've, we have challenged a local church in town um, to a basketball game for charity. And uh, in June, I think it's the first Friday in June, um, is... Uh, is, is when it's gonna, it's gonna be at uh, Tallahassee Community College. And I mean, it is gonna be the funniest bunch of basketball you've ever seen in your life because it's our staff against their staff. And um, both of us have like half our staff like doesn't even hardly know what a basketball is. So it's gonna be hilarious. So you need to go ahead and mark that out in your calendar because it's gonna be the funniest thing going on in Tallahassee that weekend. Um, but as a basketball player, I remember when we had a, a big game coming up and our coach would develop a game plan. He would, he would say, all right, you know, this is the person that averages the most on the team and so I'm gonna put my best defensive player on that person and your job is to, your job is to keep him under 20 points in the game and then this is their their, their rebounder. This guy gets 15 rebounds a game. If you could keep them under 10 rebounds in the game, and if we can keep from turning the ball over more than five times, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, he would develop a game plan. Now, if we were to go into that game, we're not gonna win the game just because we know the game plan. We're not gonna win the game just because we can memorize all the different parts of what we're supposed to do in order to win the game. The only way that we're gonna win the game is if we execute the game plan. And that's what Jesus is doing in this farewell sermon with these disciples in this room around the table. 
that he's saying, I've given you the kingdom game plan. That kingdom game plan is to love unconditionally and to serve sacrificially. But he's saying, listen guys, at the end of the day, knowing isn't going to produce the outcome that you desire in life or that God desires. Doing it will. In other words, Jesus is setting up this moment, this kind of if you do moment. And this idea of of if, this conditional idea is loaded. And the reason why it's loaded for you and I is because it always requires a choice. Am I gonna do it or am I not gonna do it? Either I'm gonna do what Jesus says or I'm not gonna do what Jesus says. But friend, let me tell you this. Here is the promise if we choose to do it. He says right here in verse 17 that God will bless you. Anybody want God's blessing on their life? Anybody want all that God has for them? Not 5%, not 10%, but all of what God has for them. If that's you, then you need to memorize the simplest mathematical equation you will ever learn. And this is it. That knowing plus doing equals blessing. Knowing doesn't equal blessing, but knowing plus doing equals blessing. I think this is what Jesus wants you and I to know today. That knowing will make us aware of the promise, but doing will allow us to walk in the promise. This word blessed in scripture, it it doesn't mean that, that uh, money's raining down on us, right? Like, thank you, Jesus, money's raining down on us. This word bless means favor. That his favor is raining down on us. And I don't know about you, friend, but I would rather have God's favor than dollar bills any day. If you do, Will you settle for the rest of your life knowing that God wants you to be generous and generous with the way that you serve others or will you do the hard thing? And Will you make the determination that I'm just not gonna walk out of here with more mind knowledge, with more scriptures memorized, but I'm going to know and I'm going to do. And when I do, The promise of God on our life is that his blessings will overtake us. I wanna kind of finish up with this idea. And it's the same idea that I think Jesus was trying to help the disciples understand and the same thing for us. But sometimes the hardest things to hear are the most life-changing things to do. Sometimes the most the hardest things to hear are the most life-changing things to do, that for the disciples to hear what Jesus was saying about you should be washing each other's feet was the hardest thing for them to hear in the moment, but it was the most life-changing thing for them to do. And that's what the Lord, I think, wants all of us to understand today. Is that yes, this is a challenging word, but it's the most life-changing thing for us to incorporate in our life. I'm telling you this from personal experience, that if you want all that God has for you, if you wanna live a blessed life where his favor is all over you, then you have to make the hard choice to love unconditionally and to serve sacrificially by being generous with yourself. First Peter 4.10 says, God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. 
He said, listen, with that gift, use them well, right? Spirit of excellence doesn't mean perfection. It means I'm gonna do the best with what I've been given to serve one another. It's not about what we could get out of it, but it's about serving and making a difference in the lives of others. I wanna close with these two questions, reflection questions that I think all of us need to ask ourselves in this moment. The first one is this, where am I serving? Where am I serving? Am I, am I like the disciples and I'm coming around the table and I'm focused on everything else but Jesus? And Am I just like the disciples who came into the room and the first thing I should have done was wash each other's feet, but I had plenty of reasons why not to do that? Like, where, where are you serving? And then the second question, without the second question, the first one becomes all about us, right? The second one, what attitude am I serving with? Like, am I serving, but am I serving with an attitude that loves unconditionally, that serves not because of what I get out of it or not because of my long list of wants and desires and preferences and agendas, but am I serving with the attitude that Christ Jesus had, that he would get up from his position of authority, that he would take off his robe and he would wrap a servant's towel around his waist He'd get on his knees and he would help wash the filth of those disciples and what they picked up on their journey from their house to dinner. Will we too be a people that won't be about our position, won't be about our robe of influence, that will humble ourselves as we have Easter coming up in a few weeks, we'll be Will we be the kind of people that won't be so focused on our own Easter experience that we will look for people that come onto this campus that may only go to church once a year or never a year, but for whatever reason, the Holy Spirit is stirred within their heart to walk onto this campus and through these doors into a church where they know nobody. And will we look at them and see their dirty feet and sit back and talk about it? Or will we have an attitude of humility? And will we go and serve them any way we can that we will risk getting dirty ourselves to help other people become clean? It's what the kingdom of God is all about. Not worship services and great, great music and great messages and the right temperature and the right volume and sound and all that stuff. The kingdom of God is all about risking ourselves getting dirty so that other people may be clean. Church, will you commit yourself to that? Listen, on the next screen, I'm gonna pray, but on the next screen, you're gonna see a QR code. And if you're here today and you sense the Lord stir in your heart and you're not really connected here, you're not serving, I wanna encourage you to take a moment and grab your phone and snap a picture of that. Or if you're uncomfortable doing that, you can grab a connect card to see back in front of you. You can check it's dream team is the, what you would check off. And you can put that in one of the black boxes on the walls when you go out. Listen, don't, don't walk out from a message like this, knowing and not doing. Andrea and I, our heart for you is to experience all that God has for you, to live a blessed life, that his favor would be upon you. But you're not gonna experience that by just knowing, you're gonna experience it by knowing and doing. Friend, what's the Holy Spirit saying to you today? Where is he challenging you to get involved and to serve others? Or where is he challenging you in the attitude by which you serve? That's the question of the day. 
Hey, how incredible was that message today? I don't know about you guys, but I know for me that my life has been changed. If you haven't done so already, take a moment, go down below and click subscribe. This is a good way to stay up to date with all the content that we're putting out, like messages that you just listened to. You can also like this video, comment down below, or even share this. Who knows, your obedience to share this video could be someone else's miracle. If you're looking for more information about Transformation Church, you can go to our website, www.transformtlh.com. This is going to give you info like service times and all that great stuff. We hope to see you, though, in person one of these Sundays. Come and say hi. We'll see you soon.